Hey, good morning, everyone. Oh, welcome to a new week. Uh, hope you all are doing well. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, Jafina, uh, can you please lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the amazing class that you're about to have. God, we ask our Holy Spirit to guide us. Mm. We ask you to open our hearts and open our eyes. And as we read the scriptures and as we listen to the class, help us to understand the meaning of every little thing that our pastor is teaching. Be with us and guide us. I bless everyone who is right here. Fill us with wisdom, knowledge, and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. <clears throat> All right, so uh, you know, a lot of students have to still join in, uh, but we will continue, we will start. Uh, last week, uh, we, we completed the whole of the covenants. We went into talking about the cross and we looked at the centrality of the cross, right? Firstly, we saw that the reason that Jesus came into this world uh, was to die on the cross, right? There was no plan B. And we looked at plenty of, instances and plenty of places where Jesus himself told his disciples that this is what is going to happen in the future. Uh, uh, in a few places, he says, uh, I'm not going to be with you any for a longer time. Uh, and, and so Jesus knew exactly the reason why he came into this world. Right. Uh, and then he, you know, also says uh, after in the road of Emmaus, where he resurrected and he meets with the two people walking on the road to Emmaus. And what does he do? He says, all this has happened to fulfill prophecies that were made about me. Right. Uh, then we looked at how Jesus in the, the scripture says that before the foundations of the world, we preach Christ crucified, right? Uh, uh, there were many instances, many opportunities. The enemy gave uh, Jesus to escape the cross. We looked at, you know, one was in, uh, you know, when Peter said, uh, uh, you know, no, Lord, this is not, this should not happen. And uh, Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. You don't have the things of uh, God, but the things of man. Uh, and then even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter cuts off the soldier's ears and, uh, you know, Jesus says, how difficult it would be for me to just call upon uh, the angels to come and help me. Uh, and so there were plenty of instances where, uh, you know, Jesus could have avoided the cross, but he knew exactly why he's come. Uh, and so we looked at the whole message of the new covenant being the centrality of the cross and the early church preached the cross uh, Peter in his first sermon preached the cross Stephen preached the cross the great apostle Paul he says with all the wisdom with all the understanding that he had from the old covenant and the new covenant and all this you know great understanding of uh, learned under gamaliel and uh, learned about judaism all that wisdom paul writes and he says if i do not preach the cross of christ i am a failure i'm not going to speak about my intellectual uh, in intellectual words i'm not going to speak with high intellectual wisdom like the greeks do but i'm just going to preach the cross of jesus christ that's why paul writes and he says the wisdom of the cross is the power of god unto salvation right? uh, so so we saw that in the early church as well when they were faced with persecution when they were faced with threats they preached the cross of Jesus Christ. And we learned something very important last week. We learned that, you know, the main message of the church must be the cross of Jesus Christ, especially in a time when, you know, we have so many tools, so many other opportunities, or I would say uh, other ways to bring about Christianity. Uh, sometimes we forget the whole aspect of bringing the cross in. So that's why Paul says, you know, uh, the, 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 my message, my ministry, 
my whole you know purpose of life is to preach cross crucified uh, Christ crucified to the Corinthians he says woe is me if I do not preach now this is a man who is intellectual he has stood in front of the learned people of, of Israel he stood in front of the Pharisees he has stood in front of uh, the learned people in Greek Greece uh, uh, the intellectuals but Paul is saying I don't depend on all these you know my abilities and my understanding which is important but my main message is the cross of Jesus Christ right and then we looked at also last week we looked at uh, you know some of the shadows of the cross and we uh, I'm sure we'll be also learning it in Christology uh, where you know we looked at the seed of the woman talking about Jesus the first clothing able sacrifice um, uh, and how God was pleased with that sacrifice God's provision uh, uh, through Abraham's son Isaac when they went up that mountain God said wait stop what you're doing and I will send my son to die on the cross it was uh, just a shadow of what's going to happen the Passover lamb uh, and and the rock from which the water came out from uh, during the time of Moses when they were in the Exodus and uh, many other places we see that the serpent in the wilderness uh, uh, the one who hangs on a tree all these was the cross prophesied or the shadows of the cross right uh, so if we read the entirety of from the old old testament up to the time of our Lord Jesus Christ we see that many 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 prophecies were fulfilled in the life of Jesus to the point to the date to the exact event I, uh, I think that's the book of Zechariah which says uh, look at him uh, humble and me coming on a donkey written hundreds of years ago right uh, <clears throat> and and so many other prophecies so we see everything lining up to the cross right so today we will pick up from Isaiah 53 the cross described so I'm on page let me see that uh, page 73 on your notes the cross described now the book of Isaiah uh, I'm sure all of us have read portions of uh, the book of Isaiah it's a wonderful book it's known as a poetic book it's known as a prophetic book it's got wonderful scriptures of you know promises scriptures of blessings scriptures of you know uh, prosperity and you know uh, strength a lot of wonderful scriptures now what is it about the book of Isaiah before we get into uh, you know how Isaiah describes the cross in Isaiah 53 let's look about Isaiah what was he who was he what is so uh, you know what is so particular or what is so uh, unique about this man Isaiah and his writings right now Isaiah the book of Isaiah was written about 750 BC uh, Malachi as we know is the last book of the Old Testament and the oldest copies of the uh, of the book of Isaiah uh, were about 900 AD so uh, we don't have to worry about the dates uh, but, but what it is is later on they find the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls and 90% of information in the Dead sea, Dead sea Scrolls was the book of Isaiah and so when you look back from the book of Isaiah that was dated uh, you know in the early uh, 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 you know 750 BC and to the Dead Sea Scrolls is about 2,000 years later both are you know uh, the same and so there is authenticity to this writing now remember the reason we're bringing this up is because this is not you know I uh, th this the Bible the whole entire Bible is not some random poetry right something that we can just uh, say okay it's a nice book 
No, it is truth. It is God's word. God in his wonderful, marvelous way had a way of protecting the scriptures uh, and through the Dead Sea Scrolls, 90% of the book of Isaiah was word to word perfect. So picture this, we are reading Isaiah 53. It's word to word perfect to the version that was written 2000 years before, right? So of course, translations would be there different, but the essence is word to word perfect, right? And what does it say? Isaiah 53, right? Uh, we, before we read that, let's look at this chapter of Isaiah 53. It talks about, you know, the cross and, um, and the sufferings of the cross that Jesus will go through. But we will look at three important views on the study of Isaiah 53, how he describes the cross. Now, David also writes about the cross. He says, you know, uh, his own friends turn his heel against him. And in another place, the psalmist writes and he says, uh, not one of his bones will be broken. Zechariah says, they will look upon the one whom they have pierced and they will moan like a, uh, like a child that moans for his uh, uh, mother. And so there are plenty of prophets in the Old Testament who have prophesied about the cross. But we, today we're just going to focus on uh, Isaiah and Isaiah 53, which is the essence of the cross. So three aspects of Isaiah 53, or three views of how we can study this portion. First view is a view that sees what Christ accomplished on the cross as foretold by Isaiah, right? So as, as we're reading Isaiah 53, let's picture this view first. What did Jesus Christ accomplish on the cross as what Isaiah has written in his book. The second view is where we as believers see what has been made available for us through the cross, right? And we all know it, right? A lot of, you know, blessings and eternal life and all that. But we look through this entire portion of scripture. And the third view will be as believers we see the imitation of the cross, which means the, the way we apply the power of the cross in our daily lives and how is it that we are to live, right? So these three aspects uh, in Isaiah 53, right? So let's look at the first point on the notes. Behold my servant. Now Isaiah 52 verse 13 says, Behold my servant, he shall be exalted and, and be very high. Let's read Isaiah 52, verse 13, so that we get a better sense of what's happening there. Isaiah 52 and verse 13. Yes, could one of us please read? Isaiah 52 and 13. Yes, anyone? Isaiah 52 and verse 13, please. Isaiah. Yes, go ahead. Isaiah, Isaiah 52, verse 13, you said, Pastor, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Behold, my servant. Now, look, let's look at the Hebrew. The Hebrew says, Ibod Adonai, which means bond servant. Now, let's, let's break it up right now. In the Old Covenant, if an Israelite, he, you know, he was in debt and he owed a certain amount of money to other people, what this person would do is say, he'll say, okay, I don't have the money, 
to repay my debt. But what I will do is I will work for you. And usually that period will be for about six to seven years. And in that six to seven years, this person is a bond servant of the master. Right. So if the master tells him do this, he has to do it. Right. If the master tells him, you know, you have to go to this other field and work the whole day, he has to do. It. If the master treats him badly, he still has to work. He, he has no choice. He, he cannot just say, no, my master is not treating me well. He can't, he can't just, you know, run away. So the word Ebod Adonai simply means bond servant. Now, after the seven years, what happens is <clears throat> the servant is free. He has paid his debt. And as a servant, he can choose. He can say, you know, my master was very good, even though I you know, worked under him, even though I was in debt. As a master, he provided for me. He looked after me. He cared for my family. Um, you know, he didn't ill treat me. And so sometimes on their own free will, they continue to serve the master. And then other, in other cases, after the seven years, they just take uh, their belongings and move away. And the debt is canceled. Now here, Isaiah is saying the word, Ebod Adonai, which means the servant of the Lord, the bond servant of the Lord. Now this word bond servant is also, it's, it's not very new to us. The, the Apostle Paul also writes in and says, I'm a, I'm a bond servant of Christ. I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm branded for Christ. He says that in many places. So what is Paul trying to say? He's trying to say, uh, uh, I'm a born servant, which means I'm under the direction. My master is the Lord Jesus. And whatever he says, I will do. If he says to me, go here or do this, I will do because I'm a born servant. I have no choice. And I'm a born servant out of my own free will. Right? And here in Isaiah 52 verse 13, Behold my Ebod Adonai, my born servant, talking about the Lord Jesus, right? Uh, he shall do prudently. The word prudently means intelligently, wisely, and pros prosperity, bringing prosperity. Right? So behold my born servant, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The bond servant, or uh, as a servant, he will come into this world. He will do what? He will do prudently. He will do wisely. He will walk in the wisdom of God. And he shall be exalted, which means he shall be, uh, take a higher place. He will be raised up. Remember the book of Hebrews? It says that uh, he made himself of nothing. And he made himself lower than angels. And he came into this world as a man to die for our sins. But God, you know, lifted him up, raised him up from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father, exalted him that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And this is written how many years before the cross? about 2,000 years odd before the cross, right? Years, years and years before. Then he, what? He shall be exalted and extolled, which means to be lifted up and be very high. Just to be exalted, to be lifted up, to be glorified, to be, uh, you know, when you say very high or exalted, it's, it's, it's no... Uh, there's no place for, you know, uh, uh, meekness there. It's a place of, you know, glory and honor. So, Isaiah foretold the resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Right? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14. Isaiah 52 and verse 14. Yes, could one of us please read that? 
Isaiah 52 and verse 14. Go ahead. Anybody? Isaiah 52 and verse 14. Isaiah 52 verse 14. As many were astonished at the visage for so man more than any man and his form and his form more than his sons of men. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Right. So we see here Isaiah is talking about the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Let's break it up. Just as many were astonished at you, the word astonished means numb or, or, or uh, uh, stunned by, what, by who you are. His visage, which means his appearance, was marred. The word marred also means disfigured more than any man and his form which means his figure or his appearance more than the sons of man now again isaiah is writing and he's saying many will see you they will be astonished with the way you are they'll be astonished with his you know his whole visage that is you know what is going to happen to him and his visage, his appearance was disfigured. Now, let me, let me share something about the cross. Uh, you know, I, I was, a couple of years back, I did a study on the cross and uh, just tried to dig in a little bit, of, little bit deep. And after studying that, it really gave me a deeper, you know, aspect, a deeper love for Christ and, his, and what he did for us. You know, the crucifixion, was introduced by the Persians, but it was perfected by the Romans. The Romans were, you know, experienced. They were professional, professionals in crucifixion, right? It is said that during Nero's time, what they would do is they would crucify people on the streets. Street, so you got the streets, right? And right next to the street, Right? So if you're walking down this road, uh, probably to get to the main market area, they would crucify people on the streets. So if you're walking, you can see people crucified. And the reason they did that was Nero wanted his people to understand that if you go against me, this is going to be your fate. Right? Now, crucifixion was usually kept for the worst of criminals. For the worst. Remember Barabbas? He was one of the worst of the criminals. He was supposed to be crucified. And in crucifixion, what they would do is they would usually, uh, you know, give the person uh, a scourging a couple of days before or even a day before. Now, why they do that is because now, Crucifixion is a painful, slow death. It's not like we're crucified and then in ten minutes you're gonna die. No, it 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 you know it's a slow, painful, agonizing death. You know, uh, I think I've shared this before. When you when a person is on a cross, he or she has lost all entitlement. A leper can come and spit on you. People can throw things at you. Uh, and, and it's a horrendous scene. Two, a Roman uh, crucifixion, the person who's being crucified is completely naked. A shameful, uh, you know, it's, it's very disrespectful, very shameful. It was, you know, it, it's a place where nobody wants to see it's a sight which nobody wants to see and isaiah is writing and he's saying his visage was marred meaning they you couldn't even recognize that was jesus 
and now i'm sure we all seen the passion of the christ the passion of the christ is very less is nothing compared to what happened on the cross right his you know, history says that his rib bones would have been seen the lord jesus' bones on his ribs would have been seen he would have been every muscle would have torn getting a cardiac arrest is is something that is you know it just tears you apart it just uh you know it there's this whole you know when you look at it scientifically it's it's extremely painful and his visage was marred you know some historians say that the reason why many of them uh you know didn't recognize jesus was because his he was so disfigured he was marred uh, but there's no proof for that but history historians theologians say that it was a gruesome sight and that's what happened isaiah prophesied this hundreds of years before third one isaiah 52 and verse 15 so shall he sprinkle many nations and kings shall shut their mouth at him for what had not been told them they shall see and what they had not heard they shall consider i'm sure this word sprinkle is something that will remind us straight uh to the old covenant sprinkling has to do with the sprinkling of the blood in the old covenant now isaiah's is prophesying hundreds of years before he's saying this man the 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 messiah when he comes he will sprinkle the blood on the nations <clears throat> probably isaiah has got this picture of saying the high priest goes into the holy of holies he sprinkles the blood but the messiah will come he will not sprinkle any blood on the altar but he'll sprinkle his blood over the nations bringing healing bringing deliverance what a powerful prophecy that is right uh, sometimes we we may just read it and then we may say okay he sprinkles the nation we may not really understand it to its you know to its uh, deep uh, meaning but it's so wonderful it expresses the the sprinkling of blood against the altar uh, uh, and and what the high priest does for the atoning of sins the word sprinkle uh, is basically what the high priest does kings leaders rulers heads of the nation will stand in amazement at jesus christ they will see they will hear and understand things they have not known on his influence over many nations kings leaders rulers heads of nations will be in amazement at this man jesus christ if we look later on right after the death burial and resurrection of our lord jesus paul stands in front of the king paul stands in front of agrippa uh front of uh felix and he, as he's sharing they were some of them were in awe what is this message he's preaching remember paul uh at mars hill in when he goes into corinth uh he's standing there he's preaching that wonderful sermon and the people are in awe of him what kind of a message is this these are leaders these are rulers these are gnostics who are very very learned but paul is standing there and he's saying uh he's saying sharing the gospel he's sharing the cross and they are in awe they are amazed even right now nations and leaders are amazed stand in awe of the cross they stand in awe of amazement of what jesus did for us right uh and so it's so wonderful that this prophecy of people standing in all of Jesus's accomplishment what Jesus did that is going to go on till the end of time nations and rulers will stand they will acknowledge Jesus as the son of god the arm of the lord isaiah 53 and verse 1 who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed now what a wonderful way to 
describe the news of Jesus' crucifixion. Isaiah is referring to a prophetic message. He's saying, people will find it hard to believe, yet this is what the arm of the Lord is. Who has really believed what we have heard? Now, if we, uh, you know, we are, we are doing the study of uh, James right now. And James, uh, the epistle of James, James is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, and in the book of Matthew and Mark, he says, you know, Jesus is ready to go for the Feast of the Tabernacles. That's going on in Jerusalem. Uh, they're all there. And uh, Jesus says, you go. I'm not coming to the feast as of now. But what does the brother say, especially James? James says he's out of his mind. If you're saying you're the Messiah, why don't you go and show yourself? Right? Why are you here? Why are you standing here? You know, we've been together for 30, what, 31 years, 32 years. We are brothers. You keep saying I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. Why are you here? Go show yourself. His own brothers thought he was mad. Mark, in the book of Mark says, they thought he was out of his mind. They said, okay, leave him. He's, you know, he's just talking something. He's actually a carpenter's son. He's my brother. His father is a carpenter. He's also, you know, helping out in the business here. But he's just talking something. Forget about him. Don't listen to him. He thought he was out of his mind. But after James saw the Lord Jesus, Acts chapter 1 uh, uh, and Acts chapter 2, they are in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. James, the, the mother of Mary, James and his brothers and sisters were there in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. Now, James has seen the Lord Jesus and his mind has changed. Saying, what he was saying was true. Now, why was it hard to believe for James? Because the Jews always considered that the Messiah will come probably as a rich ruler, maybe a Pharisee's son, or maybe a, a king, a, a rich man who would come and who would you know, take us out of this Roman captivity. Uh, that, that, that's their idea, right? They always thought the Messiah will come and take them, take the Jews out of Roman captivity. So we don't have to pay taxes. We don't have to listen to these Romans. That was the idea. And here, he's coming here into this world. He's come as a carpenter's son. Out of all the things a carpenter's son. So no, nobody really believed him, right? And so who believed our report? Paul, uh, sorry, Isaiah is saying, who will believe our report? There will be people who will not believe this. Is this the way the Messiah will come? He will come as a firstly as a carpenter. Secondly, he will come as a carpenter and then he begins to you know, do a few do these miracles and then die on the cross. The most the most humiliating death. Who has believed what we have heard? And 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 Isaiah so beautifully, you know follows that up with saying who saw in it the lord's great power so isaiah is trying to say now this report of the messiah coming as a carpenter's son dying on the cross who has believed it some of us will not believe it but who has believed it is it, it will declare the lord's great power Remember what Paul wrote? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Isaiah has written that hundreds of years before. Right? And he's also mentioning there, he's saying, who has believed that report? Even now, right? Uh, when we talk about the cross, it's offensive. People are not going to believe it. What are you talking about? The cross, 2003. 2,000 odd years back, man in, from Jerusalem dies, and we're talking about him now. Uh, uh, no, no, thank you. I'd rather subscribe for something else, not this. You go speak to a fervent Jew in Israel even today. They, 
you know, I, was, I was watching this video that somebody had sent me. Uh, there was this group of, you know, charismatic believers, I guess. Uh, they were in Jerusalem on the streets and they began to preach from Isaiah 53. And these group of Jews come and they say, he's not the Messiah. How can he be the Messiah? And, you know, uh, the Messiah will come as a king. He's not. A, and, and, you know, there's this translations that are happening. And the video, the Jews are only saying the Messiah will come as a king. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come as a king. Right? They've forgotten the whole thing of Isaiah 53. Do you know that uh, when you talk about Isaiah 53, the Jews will nine out of ten times say, let's not talk about it. They don't read Isaiah 53. Uh, you know, I'm talking about fervent Jews who are truly uh, waiting for the Messiah and they truly love the Lord. They love God. They honor God. You know, truly, they just, you know, they just missed the point of the Messiah, but they truly love God. They want to live a holy life and all of that. But you talk about Isaiah 53, they're not going to, uh, they will come up with, you know, maybe some kinds of, uh, uh, you know, answers which don't really make sense. And mostly they don't read it. Uh, but even if you don't read it, it does not change the fact. The fact that, who has believed our report because there is power in that cross even now for the jews it's offensive now uh, if you if you go into the streets of jerusalem and or you talk to a fervent jew and you tell them jesus is the messiah they get really offended say how can he say that now isaiah is writing this hundreds and thousands of years before and now we are reading it in 2022. It is still true. Who has believed it? Some people they, they take offense to it. John chapter 12, verse 36 to 43 says, While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, may be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the Lord, arm of the Lord, been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Right now, Isaiah is not writing this, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, relaxing probably in front of a, uh, you know, nice water wave that's coming or maybe having a great meal with his friends. No, 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 no. Isaiah is writing this, verse 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. This is glory that is revealed from heaven, prophetic words released from heaven. He saw it, he heard it, he wrote it, and that's why it's true. Verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They should be put out of the sin, lest they be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Right? I love that verse here. It says, Therefore, they could not believe. They saw all the signs, they saw the wonderful miracles that Jesus did, yet they could not believe. Can you can you just picture this, right? Lazarus is dead. There's a group of people outside. They all have seen Lazarus dead three days back. Jesus comes. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He said, wow, Jesus, you are truly a great person. You're a prophet. You, you are the Messiah. Then there's five loaves of bread, two fish. There are thousands of people. And the people are there sitting there. Jesus turns it 
those five loaves of two and two fish feeding thousands. They all see the miracle. What happens? Oh wow, you are the Messiah, you are you are the king, you are great. Couple of maybe a year or so later, the he's handcuffed, taken by the Roman prisoners, is taken as a Roman prisoner, or he's standing in front of Pilate. What are these same people saying? Crucify him. The same people. Maybe not all of them, but they were there. We don't see any account of people coming and saying, no, he is the Messiah. We've seen the great miracles. He is the Messiah. No, no. So, crucify him. Before that, they put palm leaves down. They said, Hosanna to the King of Kings and all of that. Next thing, crucify him. Why? Because their belief was temporary. Now, as believers, we must be very, very cautious. And we must maintain integrity in this area, especially at times when things are not going well in our lives. We say, God, you know, I trust you. I believe you and all of that. And that's wonderful. And God comes through for us. We say, God, you are, you know, you are God. You are the one who has helped me through the season. But what about times when you're not, when we are not coming out of those difficult challenges? We are seeing challenge after challenge after challenge. It's just continual. We have to stand firm even during at those times and say, God, I will believe that you are, I will believe your report. I will believe in what you say about me. I'm not going to listen to what people say. You know, the problem that happened in uh, Jerusalem that time was people were talking, right? People were talking. Yeah, he's, you know, maybe a prophet, a great healer, whatever. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, he's been put into prison now. I think they may crucify him. And then they were talking. And then the word went out and they were all discussing. And, you know, <clears throat> probably that's what happened. They forgot about you know, the miracles that God did, the wonderful signs, the way that God brought healing. The book of John says he healed so many people, everyone who came to him. Not everything has been recorded. But I'm sure there are plenty of miracles where the Lord Jesus did and people saw it. They were eyewitnesses to it. Yet after Jesus dies, there are only 120 people in the upper room who truly held fast from thousands to 120 people but god is god from 120 it became 10000 people immediately who has believed the report of the lord because it is the power of god isaiah 53 and verse 2 says for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, when we say before him, you see the him is a capital H, which means before the father, for he, the servant, that is the born servant, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, he shall grow up before him, before God the father, as a tender plant and as a root out of the ground. He has no form or com or comeliness which means no splendor or magnificence and when we see him there is no beauty in his appearance that we should desire him it is not like okay jesus was this uh, you know of course we have a lot of artists who have depicted jesus with wonderful cat eyes and long hair and blonde hair and all of that uh, you know looking like these supermodels and all of that uh, that's their depiction, uh, but the Bible says that there was, he was just a regular man. He looked like a regular Jew, right? Uh, it says here that for he shall grow up, the servant shall grow up before him, that is God the Father, as a tender plant. The word tender plant refers to you know, his watchful eye, the, the watchful eye of the Father, right? Now, when you have a plant that you've put into the ground um, and it's just sprouting up, right? You're not going to go near that plant and, you know, uh, keep throwing sand on it or 
you know, forcefully pour water on it. You're going to look after it very, you know, it needs to gain a little more strength. Right? So you're going to be very tender with it. Uh, you're going to make sure that, you know, uh, it, it is done the right way. Uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, you're familiar with cashew. Uh, even I'm not too familiar, but I remember, uh, you know, uh, one of our church members, they've got a whole cashew uh, plantation. And he was telling me how careful they have to be in pulling out those cashews, right? You can't be rough. It's going to just crush otherwise and it'll be wasted. Uh, and so he shall grow up like a tender shoot. God's hand of nurture and protection over the Messiah as a child. Can you picture that? You know, the Lord Jesus, seven years old, eight years old, 10 years old, growing up like a little boy. He's got his, you know, brothers and sisters with him. But he, the servant, will grow up before God the Father as a tender shoot. Right? The Father's nurturing hand will be upon him. Whether the, you know, the natural parents, Joseph and Mary, were, of course, they were doing their part as well, but God's tender hand was upon him. Why? Because there's a purpose, right? When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him which means he didn't come in any pomp or any show. Jesus didn't come and say, listen, I am the Messiah, put a crown on me. Uh, and, you know, he didn't tell, nowhere has he told his disciples, I'm the Messiah, can you, uh, you know, uh, you put me, uh, take me around the city and, you know, make put some good clothes on me and put a robe and, uh, uh, you know, nowhere. No way. There was no pomp. There was no show. It was just simple, right? He came with utter simplicity. Here was Almighty God who came in as a man. He could come with such great display of greatness and power. Don't you feel Jesus could have come, you know, just as, you know, now I'm just painting a picture for you, right? Uh, what if Jesus could have come as a 15-year-old young man? You know, ready, already full of wisdom, wearing his crown. You know, the book of Revelations talks about this, you know, the glorified Jesus. Oh, he's wonderful. He's got, he's got a white horse. He's sitting there with a sword on his hand and his day on his right hand, right leg is written the Ancient of Days. On his left is written the King of Kings and the horse is a white glorious horse. His eyes are like burning fire. His hair is like wool. His, his feet like burnt grass, burnished grass. And you got this whole picture. Why didn't Jesus come that way? Why didn't he come in all that glory and authority? Isaiah said, he will come in simplicity. Carpenter's son. Right? This even caused the Jews to stumble at the fact that he was the Messiah. Can you picture... Uh, it's 10.50, I know we'll take a break, but let me just complete this. Uh, can you picture this? Right? Uh, Andrew... Uh, he was John's disciple. And John's dis John is saying, don't come after me. There's the Messiah. Go after him. Now they look at Jesus and they say, we are waiting for this all these years, the, the Israelites. As Jews, are we waiting for this person? But he doesn't look any great. I mean, he's just looks like a regular man who's walking about. Uh, he's the Messiah. So John says, yes, go. He's the Messiah. Andrew goes. But when he spoke, the power of God came out. Andrew believed. And he went and found Peter. Again, what if Peter would have said, how can this guy be the Messiah? Now, I'm a fisherman. I know I've seen people. I don't think this person can be the Messiah. But when Jesus spoke, the power of God was revealed. And, and when Jesus spoke, Peter believed. But if he went by his appearance, there's nothing to believe that he's a Messiah. That is, the, that is why the people in his own city ignored him. You can't be a prophet in your own city. They ignored him. Right? They said, this man is... We've seen Jesus. He's been walking around here from the time he's a small kid. 
you're telling me the messiah is this little boy growing up it was too much for them to comprehend so they didn't believe it was a stumbling block because they believed that the messiah would come to restore the kingdom and the nation of israel right uh, okay let's take a break we'll come back at 11:5 it took a few minutes extra we'll come back at 11:5 and we'll continue